welcome to uh, Bunkai Jitsu Volume 5. Uh, Bunkai is the, um, means it's kind of like the, the analysis, the combative application of the, the techniques of the kata. Now the katas are quite widely practiced. What's not so widely practiced is the, um, the actual applications, what the movements mean, uh, what they represent. Now again, in recent years we've seen a boom in this, this uh, a return to this um, analysis of, of kata. People are interested in the, the combative applications. And that's what we'll be showing you in this, uh, this DVD. Uh, the, the particular kata we're looking at is uh, Chinto, um, or sometimes called Gankaku. Chinto being the original name, and Chinto was a, a Chinese sailor who became uh, shipwrecked on, uh, on Okinawa. And in order to um, support himself, to provide for himself, he started, uh, so the story goes, stealing uh, food and things whenever he could. Um, the, the king of Okinawa got word of this and sent his chief bodyguard, which was the, the legendary karate martyr, master Matsumura, to, to deal with, uh, with Chinto. And as the story goes, the two got into uh, a fight and um, Matsumura very rarely found, that, you know, this, found himself equally matched, that Chinto knew what he was doing. So what he said was he made him a deal. He said, you know, I'll look after you while you uh, live at, um, on Okinawa until you can get back home and in return you teach me your uh, fighting methods. And this kata, Chinto, was created by Matsumura to record the methods that, that Chinto, the, uh, the, the, the sailor, had, had, sh had shown him. In Shotokan nowadays, it's called uh, Gankaku, which is Japanese, uh, means crane on a rock. And, and that's in reference to the distinctive one-legged postures you'll see through, uh, throughout the kata. So we'll now have a look at the kata itself. And as with all the katas, there's variations from school to school and group to group. So it doesn't really matter if you perform the kata in exactly the same way, way I do. It's just to give you um, a, a frame of reference. And we'll discuss all the style variations as we uh, analyse the kata itself. Having seen the, the cat that performed uh, straight through, we'll, we'll now uh, perform it a little bit slowly to give you a chance to uh, see some of the intricacies of the movement. And again, it doesn't really matter if you do it in exactly the same way as, as I personally, as I do personally, because we'll look at those um, style variations when we, we get into the, the combative application of the techniques. We'll now move on to the, uh, the actual application of the, the techniques that the kata records. We'll now start analysing uh, Chinto Gankaku kata and we'll look at the application to the first uh, four movements and I'll just bring on uh, Murray to have a look at that. First four we've got are, uh, this sequence here and there's slight variations on the stance depending on uh, which style you practice but the, the fundamental idea is the same. So what we've got here is that the opponents uh, reach round and grab the back of the, uh, the neck, which is a good position to control me from. Um, when this happens, I need to get rid of this pretty quick because he's got a, a good datum from here and he can start firing those punches in towards me. Now, because the hand's hooked, it's kind of like the, like the end of a walking stick. If, if I just try and retreat straight out, he'll just pull me straight in. So what, what I need to do is, is, is turn my body, which will open that hook up, so, which again, we should get back with the cat stepping backwards here. Now once I've done that, again, now the hook's like this, this arm will, uh, much easier to get rid of, much easier to push off. 
What the counter does as it pushes is it puts this hand on the back of the elbow joint. So you're kind of hitting there. Now in, in training, I'm not going to do this, but the idea is what you're doing there is kind of hitting either side to kind of hyperextend the arm. So it gives the opponent a, a jolt, a, a pain. It also injures the, the arm for us from there, softens it up for the next few techniques. So going from there. This arm again that rotates through as we turn and push. Now some styles do it here, some styles do it here. It's the same idea, just locking from a slightly different position. Opponent's head is now presented, so I would hit with that first punch, seize to control, and hit with the, uh, the second punch. Being the full sequence of four. So the opponent seizes, one, two, three, four. Now the fifth movement is uh, an alternative. So we've got um, that way of dealing with the grab, we've also got this, the kind of turn and pivot down for the, uh, into the movement into horse stance. So on that one what we're doing is we, it's a throw, we're throwing the opponent across, across the bar. So it's the same initial start, same idea. I want to turn from there and I'm taking these arms off, pushing these arms off. I'm then going to take this arm down, do what the cutter does. This uh, uh, leg goes forwards and that arm shoots underneath. So I can either just hook that arm underneath or I can grab the, uh, the clothing if it's, if it's there to be grabbed. And then I'm going to step out, just rotate my body from there, pull the uh, opponent towards my hips and just take him over and uh, around from there onto the ground, which again resembles the, uh, the final position in the, uh, the form. So I'll just show that one more time. So the grabs uh, came on from there. We're moving back, getting rid of the arm. You can put in a strike here if you like. Move through, take hold of the arm, step out, over the back of the hip, up and over. And once your opponent's on the floor, obviously you can uh, finish as you see fit. Now look at the uh, application for, uh, for this sequence. Hands go up, down, into the uh, lower cross block there. Uh, blocking manoeuvres are obviously fundamentally flawed. You're trying to use two of your arms to tie up one of your opponents. It's very, very unlikely that you get uh, blocks to work anywhere, particularly blocks of, of, of that type. And it's not that there's anything wrong with the movement. It's just been the movements are being applied in the wrong way. And the, the analogy I like is um, if you give somebody a, a nail and a, a paintbrush and said, hammer the nail in with that, um, it's, it's, it's the wrong tool for the job. It's not that there's anything wrong with the paintbrush. They're just using it for the wrong thing. So we'll look at the sequence in a, in a more pragmatic way, um, if I just borrow a mark from here. So we're fighting from a, from a clinch, a real fast way to get, finish a fight off is if I can attack one of his vulnerable areas. So I've got good control of his neck, I might reach up and again from there I'll, I'll put my, uh, my fingers in towards his eyes from there. I've done that of course, he's going to take exception to that and he's going to try and protect his eye. So when he grabs, this is where the cut the sequence uh, is, is applicable. So I'd step back, bring the arms through to there, so this arm is going on top of his. I then push down with both of the arms to lock the opponent's wrist up and take him forward. Now what might happen at that point is, is that the grip just might come off. I might go from there, it might just come loose and then I can just explode back at him. Uh, when I've gouged the eyes, it, it, that's going to be a really tight grip. It's going to be the tightest grip he can possibly do because he's protecting his eyes with that grip. So sometimes it won't come off. So what the cutter tells us to do then is, is kick the shins from here. Now nowadays it's like a double kick and you a little bit higher, but we, we, application-wise, we want to be thinking low. So I kick low from here, pull the arms back, cross block, he's pushing the head down and hooking that arm through. So this arm goes over the top, onto the back of his neck, I'm reaching through, taking hold of his clothing. Now, I'm using the gi here, but that could be the hoop of a um, sweatshirt. You can even just grab the clothing itself. You know, rather than the neck, just grab the clothing anywhere and pull back, it'll still work. So you're grabbing there, pulling across the neck as you, as you, as you pull in, strangle the opponent out. So the full sequence from there is gouge the eyes, step back, pull in, kick and kick, here to there, pull through and strangle. Now, what you might get from this position is if Mark was to push straight towards me from here, I'm in a nice strong posture, I can resist his movement. What he might do is he might try to change the angle. And what the cat shows with this sequence is, is kind of this movement is how to deal with that change of uh, the direction of force. I mean, one simple way is if he's just starting to move at that angle, I can, I can just readjust from here. What I can also do is add energy to his push. So we'll just do this one nice and slowly. So as, um, if Mark was to kind of push towards me from there, he, he's getting nowhere, so it changes the angle. If I just step and move around, uh, you get this in the cutter where it comes round, and then the arms uh, drop in, pull through. But what I'm doing there is it's this arm here that's pushing against his neck like that. And as I move around, that'll, that'll take him off balance and onto the floor. So if he starts to step round in that direction, I step faster than he can handle which again will take the opponent down and I can finish him off uh, easily from there. Now, in the style that I practice, as I move, the hands come free. Which I take to mean it's saying, let him drop, let go of him. 
In some styles, it stays tight. Now, one of the ways you can view that is that could be re-secure the strangle. So if the opponent manages to stay on his feet, for example, um, and let's say I'm pulling across his chin and I don't realise it. If he starts to move round from there, it's this hand that's adding energy to the, the turn on the back of his neck. So as he's spinning round, that can be a chance for me to readjust his hand, you know, and then kind of re-secure that strangle. So one of the, the ways of interpreting that is if it isn't quite on, as you start to move him, adjust with this hand for the styles that, that, that keep those, those arms in position. Now, if he, if he is having a good day, I've gone for the eye gouge, which he's counted. I've kicked him. I've got to strangle him. That hasn't worked for me. He hasn't gone out yet. He moves right the way around from there. He manages to maintain his feet. I've still got the strangle on. For whatever reason, it's not working. Uh, you often get this in kata. It gives you solutions to the, the problems. The next movement in the form is this. So what they've got to saying is, if it's still not working for you, just keep a good control of his arm, shift to the side from there, and hit down on the back of his head uh, with your uh, hammer fist strike. So you've got that movement here. So strangling ain't working for me here and hit. Maybe hit a couple of times, strike, and then obviously uh, move away. So you've got a whole sequence with, uh, there, starting from an eye gouge, runs through a possible scenario, and gives you a few options for, uh, if it's not working for you, then, then try this. A lot of the, uh, the movements in kata have uh, multiple functions. You can use them for lots of different things. And, and some of the, you know, the great masters have, have, have told us this. They've, they've told us to analyse the captain and explore every possibility. That, that, that each move can have more than one, uh, one function. Now, obviously, when you start doing that, you might come up with applications that the, the founder of the captain never had in mind. Now, they may put a generic movement in there, which they knew, you know, they put it in because it had three or four applications. Now, you might discover a fifth or a sixth. Um, now, historically, that application is not valid. Uh, pragmatically, though, it is. If it works, it's, it's a good application. Um, so, you, for my way of thinking, I'm not really um, an historian. I'm not really interested in historically the way the kata was used. I'm interested in the way it can be practically used. Um, so, when I'm looking at alternatives, if I come up with alternative applications that, that weren't considered, um, then that's obviously fine. You just need to explore the movement in as much depth as you can. And if a movement works, then, then it's valid. So, if we look at like an alternative way of using this, this cross block at the end of the sequence we've, uh, we've just looked at, and I'll use uh, Fred to show that one. So we'd done the eye gouge again, Fred had uh, grabbed up, we'd pulled in from there, we'd gone in with the, the double kick, and then we'd use the cross block as a, a strangle. Now, what well, alternative we can use, again, if the arms came off, is to feed this arm up the opponent's back, catch with this wrist, and grab that one, which again looks the same as the, the cross block from there. And then the same stepping motion again, uh, as I step around with this front foot, we'll pull this arm up the opponent's back from there, and take him around take him over and, uh, and off balance. It's kind of yeah, just going up his, his back from there. So just saw that from the, the other side. So strip that arm off, feeding through from here, up the back, seize with this one, bring this one over onto the top of his back, back from there. So there's your first cross block. Stepping round with that front foot as I swing this uh, arm up and round. That takes the opponent's um, arm up his back and uh, an over he'll go. So just one last time with that one. So from, from there, through to here, step around, take the opponent over. Over he goes. There's obviously, uh, with every movement, as well as looking at the way the cutter does it, you can look at alternative applications yourself. So you can play with this one. You could step and you could throw the leg through, for example, when you took him over. Or you can even do it from your back. Um, if you've seen the joint lock series of DVDs, you'll have seen that one. Very common lock in uh, judo, jiu-jitsu circles. So look at the way the cutter does it, explore variations, uh, look at the way other arts use it, and explore those possibilities too. After the, uh, the Gedan sequence, we have uh, this movement, which, as we said, that can be used as a, a strike to follow up a failed strangle. It can also be used if the arm lock isn't working, the opponent swung right round. Just do exactly the same, hook it and hit. The next one, again, we've got another one with, uh, with open hands, and I'll bring uh, Murray on and we'll look at the, uh, the application for that one. Um, now it depends on how you do this movement. Different styles do it in, in subtly different ways, and it's, it's always good to look at how other styles do the movements and ex explore applications for their sequence. It lets you see the... Uh, the information that kata contains its entirety. Now, some bring the arms all the way up here before the chop down, where some don't bring this arm up. So we'll look at one application for, uh, for each. Now, uh, blocking at close range really doesn't work very well because you haven't got the time, space, or reaction, uh, distance to react. So what we'll often do is we'll cover, just bring our hands up and cover our head. Now, if during the course of this fight, I'm covering up from there, Murray starts swinging in with punches around the side there, I'm going to feel that bashing against my arm. Now, what you sometimes get um, in a... A self-defense situation is uh, the, the guy you're fighting might not have a wide range of, uh, of techniques. He might only have one or two punches. 
but he'll have used these in loads and loads of real fights. It's not like fighting a trained martial artist with loads and loads of, of, of you know, infinite number of techniques. So what you sometimes find is they'll get one technique and they'll just keep repeating it. They might have a good right hand punch or a good left hand punch. They'll just go bang, 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 bang. And the same punch will keep coming at you all the time. Um, you know, for example, I'll grab and just keep unloading with the same arm. You get that kind of thing. So what may happen is the first one might hit you and you might move your arms to kind of cover that. And then the second one comes in, the third one comes in. Now, by the time, obviously, that first one might get me if I'm still in the fight, the second one comes in, but then hopefully I'll have my arms up in the way. One of the applications of, of this bit of that move. Now, having feel that arm make contact with mine, if I just follow that arm movement through from there, it'll push this opponent's arm to one side. Now, I can follow up with lots of different things, but what, what the cutter does after that is it steps forwards and does this. So um, that's the application we'll look at. So we're going to move the arms to there. Now, with that circular movement, Murray's posture is a little bit messed up now. If I step forwards, keep my hand towards his, uh, his elbow and his shoulder as I move in, and again, he's kind of push with the application of this. So it gives me room. So at that point there, I'd be running as fast as I could in, in that direction. So again, so this hooks of swing here, there. Okay, so just kind of like just shoving in and away. So one last time, hook comes in, cover in this direction, swing the arms down to mess the opponent's posture up, step through, push. Using my mass to give me uh, room. You could have just hit him, of course, as well. It's just the, the option the catter has chosen is to, to kind of push through. Now, a, a, an alternative application where the arms come low is if the opponent pushes. And again, you can sometimes get repeated pushing too. Um, and then I could use this hand here to kind of deflect that. Right. This arm from there then would grab this one, keep control of it, make sure it's not going to go anywhere I want it to. And then from there, it'll strike down the groin. Been the, uh, another application for that. So the opponent pushes from there, again, you're moving that arm through, hitting and striking in. You can also do it if you become aware of the opponent's arm too. So we're fighting and my arm's coming into contact with his, I can use the same movement. Deflect, use this one to push it down, strike it towards the groin. And again, same idea, once we've got that and we've hit, bring the hands to here, I can step forwards and uh, push the opponent and uh, gain distance. So there's two op applications for that movement. Depending on which style you, you do, do, will depend on which one you'll favour. But it's important to explore them all and to practice uh, both. In the last uh, technique we saw, we can use this as a kind of a push um, to gain some, some distance. We can also use it close in too. If I uh, bring Mark on and we'll, we'll look at that. Um, we talked about briefly about covering up on the last technique as well. So again, the point sees the back of the neck. And we have the options from earlier on in the kata. Um, but what one option we've got for me, especially if he's unloading with punches, is to make sure we cover up from here. So I'd, I'd rather take a blow to my arms than to my face, you know. Then the next movement for the form from there, covering up to in case any potential punch comes in, but then I'm going to slap in towards the, 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 the shoulder here, strike it towards it, and towards the, the side of the opponent's neck. So I'm kind of starting to break this grip off from here and hit in towards the, uh, the neck there. Um, an alternative way, again, what you, you, uh, the same movement, is if the opponent's swinging punches with that hand, you can jam them at the shoulder as well, which again is the, the, the same move. So either one of them you can use. Uh, I'll stick with the, the chopping one at the moment. So I'll, I'll be coming up from there, moving in and hitting. Now having done that, this grip is starting to go now because his arms are a bit messed up and bent, but I haven't got rid of it completely. So the next movement in the form is you've got the arms coming to here. So you're kind of like wedging in against that side. So again, so having struck from there, and, um, disrupted his thinking patterns, weakened him slightly, I bring this arm back this way and knock the arm off. Right, so we just move around the other side and, and show that one. So I point and seize, I move in and hit from here to there. So this movement again, stepping in, bashing these arms. This arm then is grabbed and that arm comes down. So we have the option there of pulling this arm down to gain control and hammer fist into the, uh, the opponent's groin. So the full sequence again, grabs, hit, bash, strike. Um, from here as well, the next movement, of course, in the form is going to these bits. So you can add that on too. Uh, one way of, of doing that is to bring the arm back this way, so you're kind of striking with it. Uh, of course, in the kata, you're looking in this direction. So um, if you were striking, I, I would be looking that way. So uh, uh, another application that takes it to, to use, uh, into account the head movement is you're setting them up for a throw. So we're hitting, bashing, striking, bring the arm up to here. And then, you know, your shoulder throws or whatever else you wanted to do from there. I've already seen the, the one from earlier on in the kata where we stepped round and, and took him over the, uh, the base of the uh, spine. We'll, we'll also look at some other throws later on. So that's uh, one final option from there. So you're moving through, hitting, bashing, striking, throw. Um, the arm position for the throw and the various throws are recorded at various other points through the kata. Some we've seen, some we'll move on to see. Now look at uh, an alternative um, use of, of, of this sequence here. 
bring on Fred and talk about that one. So again, in this kind of pre-fight thing, if I was trying to control distance, what Fred might try and do is grab that arm and pull it down to open me up for that punch. Um, so we can use this to, to kind of counter that. So we'll just look at it. So as the grab comes in from there, I'm going to step to the side and bring my arms up to here. Now what this does is it, it, the punch from there takes me away from the punch. I'm safe now. I'm behind kind of Fred's arm from there. And uh, in training, obviously, I'm not going to do this, but the idea would be to kind of bash against the back of this arm to hyperextend it. So again, to, you know, to actually physically injure the arm itself. What we're then doing is the arm's grabbing and we're coming down to there to kind of uh, hammer fist to the groin again, which again is following the sequence of the form. So a fairly simple technique. Your opponent's pulled the arm down, the punch is coming, we're covering from there, move down and hit. All right? Might be lucky when we get to, to there. Again, this grab might not be that strong, might turn from there and it just might bash off, which is great. You know, I'll just float to something else straight away. But if the grip's still on, then obviously I still need to keep dealing with that one, so I'll just counter it, grab it, strike down to here. Now, the next sequence, of course, we've got the, the Gidans and Sotos. One way of using that is to uh, exploit this vulnerability here. Because now I've got this arm pulled across, it's open there. So I swing the forearm around, strike into the neck from there. And then just put my hand underneath the jaw and pull the head back. So I've got this momentary arm lock and his neck's crank. Now, I'm not going to hold him here forever. It's just a nice position that kind of opens him up. So from there, again, this hand, uh, I can normally strike through from here. But his neck position, I can go into chokes and strangles. Or also, because of where he is, I can just pull him back and drop him. Um, so again, you know, it kind of gets you to a position where you've got a big advantage. So it's up to you to make sure you exploit that advantage. So opponent sees, I'm moving round and hitting to here. Striking into the groin, hitting, pulling the hand uh, underneath the jaw and pulling back. Then from there, as I was saying, you've got the option of releasing and striking this way. Moving on to chokes and strangles, or just from there, just pulling him straight back. Okay. In practice, keep your uh, partner's head up so they obviously they, they don't hit the floor. So that's another use of, uh, of this sequence, uh, sequence there. Now look at some uh, more alternatives for these, uh, these motions here. Just bring on, on Murray to explore them. So the first one we saw, about, we just saw that one with Fred, getting behind the point, using this and cranking the net um, to kind of open them up. And you can obviously do that any time you get the, uh, the, the, the opponent's back. And one way in which you can view these next sequences is the cat that's kind of mapping that out for you. So if, if I've managed to get the opponent's back, put this arm here underneath the neck, I might go for this arm, I might step out in that direction. And again, that will turn and uh, crank him for me. And then I've got all those other options I wanted to use from there as well. So, you know, if I get the back stepping out to here, then I've got the striking, the pulling, the choking. There's other stuff I can do. So it's just man manoeuvring the opponent when you're behind them. Good position to be anyway, of course. So you might not decide to, to, to open the opponent up in this way. But it's, it's certainly one option. The next sequence, of course, it kind of steps up. So you can almost do that as a little floor, you know. So I've gone to there. opponent comes around, I go to here. And I can practice it doing it the other way too. Um, so again, what it's basically saying, whenever you get your opponent's back, you've got this option of kind of cranking his neck, barring his arm, and you can follow on and, and flow with it. Um, another way of using that one is if the arm again gets pulled down to the point to get the punch in. Again, I'll bring the arm up to here. Raise the arm, open the opponent up from there, and I'm going to strike it towards the groin. Which again, being the, uh, the application of, of this. So I'm moving through to there and hitting here. Um, you can also use the technique from the inside, and that gives us a few throwing options. So if I've got control of the opponent's arm from there, I pull the opponent's arm up and I hit into the groin. Then these little step forwards, you can view those as lifts. Well, one of the big clues on that, well, a way of thinking with this, is there's a bit where you do this, which it looks like you're kind of turning your back on your opponent. Um, now, probably the only time you do that um, is, is throwing. Um, when you, so th this is kind of like the big keys. When you see moves where you do this, it normally means you're setting up for some kind of throw. So we've got the um, hitting into the groin from there, then we're stepping up. So what that can be is keeping this hand high and pulled, I'm going to hook, uh, grab that uh, lead leg. So from there I'm going to step through and up, and take the point up to here. Now on the next movement, if I was to step out and kind of throw him over, think of, of, of the cat I hit, I'll get him on my shoulders, take him over. But again, it resembles a cat movement, it'll flip over and, uh, and drop onto that side. So that's one way we can hook the leg. So again, from, from, from there into here. So I kind of hook it this way. But I can also hook it turning my back. If I was on the, on the other side, um, so we're doing it on the same side of the cat. I could just go straight forward. All I could do is this. So having go and control the arm and hammer fist to the groin, I can go this way. And step up and go that way. You know? And again, I would turn and throw the opponent over in that direction. So we had a whole sequence of, 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 of throws there. Okay, catch and hit, lift them up and drop them. We can also use this as a catch and hit, in case you lift them up and drop them that way. So the, the whole sequence, again, gives you that kind of left to right, right to left uh, kind of flow. So, and again, that's another example of a throw from uh, Gankaku Chinto Kata. 
So after those sequence of, uh, of cross blocks, we have uh, this is the next uh, next move. And we'll look at two or three functions for that. And if I just bring on my, one of the ones, it, it flows on nicely from the throws. Um, so if we'd thrown the opponent to the ground, using the, the lifts that I showed before, you often have one of the arms of the opponent drop. And you can use this as a, as a, uh, a shoulder locking technique, which again, it's found its way into Godan. So that, um, obviously, Chinto on, uh, has a strong influence on, on, on Godan. You can see many techniques and similarities. So if you're familiar with Pinan Godan, you may, may also be familiar with this technique. So the, the arm drops down between the opponent's head and arm, and I kick that arm back. So it, it gets bent at this 90 degree angle. I don't want the opponent to pull the arm out. So I secure it, and then I secure that hand. So it's nicely locked in from there. Take the leg over to the side, and you can see that resembles your, uh, your, reverse, uh, your reverse cat stance and cross block. And if I just talk from there, that'll take the opponent's arm out. Um, so just hooking there, grabbing here, grabbing there, throwing the leg over, talking the opponent's uh, arm. It's a variation, you can, you can also do it the other way. If the opponent's arm's pointing the opposite direction. Smaller, it's just the same idea. Pin, pin, pin. Of course, this time, you bring your foot in front of the neck from here. And again, you just turn and talk in that direction. Uh, not as strong, but, but um, it's an alternative. So in the cutter there, it shows the throws and then a possible potential uh, shoulder lock, ground fighting follow-up. Uh, one other way you can use that movement is a variation of the choke that was shown later on. Um, so if you think this cutter was, was put together to record Chinto teachings, it's theoretical that he'd show one strangle and a few weeks later or months later, so he's another one. So you sometimes find that in cutter. You get like a basic version earlier on and then you get like an alternative or a, a more in-depth variation later. So one option we might have, but before we saw how if um, we're doing this strangle, how if Mark changed the angles, we could have problems, and how the basic stance from there was helping me uh, uh, stop me being pushed off balance. So if Mark pushes in towards me there again, obviously I can stop that. But one thing I can also do if he's not pushing is I can drop down onto my knees, which again is your, your cross block from your reverse cat stance. Now what that does is it, it, it greatly enhances the effect of the strangle and it makes the, uh, the groins less vulnerable to attack. Um, so, um, th this one here hurts quite a bit, okay, uh, th this one here, it hurts a lot more. So that uh, kind of dropping down at the one knee and then applying this same strangle we saw earlier can be um, a really effective way to finish the opponent off. Now look at the, uh, this whole sequence, uh, or ways of using uh, that, that sequence. We saw some applications for the, the cross block on its own, now we'll combine it with other, other techniques. Just bringing uh, Fred there. So one we might have is again if a opponent sees his low on both uh, both wrists here. So my awareness maybe hasn't been what it should be, and the opponent's managed to, to kind of secure this grip. So what I would do from there is I'd drop into stance, um, throwing my body weight that way and down to bring this arm underneath that one. And what I'm going to do is take my weight in that direction by stepping out, so this will bend into the back of the opponent's wrist this way. So again, it's grabs so one, two, okay, and that will get the arms uh, the arms free from there. The next move of the cutter, of course, does this. Uh, the double get on. So we're going to go from here, one, two, pull. Okay, so we're taking the opponent's uh, hair down from there. And then we've got the hand snapping to the hip. So what we're doing from there is just grabbing the opponent's head. So once we've got that reverse headlock, if I've just moved Fred round, you're in a really good position to kind of finish off. Hammer fist strikes to the solar plexus. You can do knife hand strikes towards the throat from there. I can reach under and I can crank his neck from that position. I can step back and let him drop. So the cat has got me into a nice, uh, strong position there. So there's loads of different options I can, I can come on with. We've also got a way we can use this one is the opponent pulls the arm down uh, to try and open me up for a, a strike, okay? So I'm trying to maintain distance, he, he grabs, feeling that I move around. So it's similar to what we saw before, but again, a slightly more in-depth version. So we're striking there, bashing into the back of the arm. If the arm doesn't come off uh, from, from there, do have the hammer fist we saw before. But another way we can use this is just to grab here and push on the back of the arm to, to lock the opponent's... Um, arm up and take him down. You've got this, uh, that movement there. So, to here and then to there. You can also just let this flow on and uh, strike him in the, uh, the face with it too. Now, as well as the, the head grab being this way, the cat also shows it from the sides too. So it's one side and the other side. Um, so what this uh, means is if the opponent grabs there, I move to here and bash, say the arm comes off. Uh, what I can do from there is I can pull this arm through, grab the opponent's hair and then twist this way. So I'm getting that, 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 uh, that headlock on. Then again from there, I've got all the various options I could um, do. We've got chokes and strangles, which we saw before, various rollovers. I can trank, uh, crank him and strangle him. I'm in a nice position. I've got good control over him. Um, so we're going from there. The arms come free. There, there's your double get on. Twist your body to get your, uh, your headlock on. And then again, you know, you can roll through and hook and all kinds of things from there, all kinds of alternatives. 
Now, that movement is essentially symmetrical as well. When you, you do this and that, sorry, this and that. Um, so you could do it off the other arm. So the point to grab that way, I would, I would go this way, okay? If it bashed off, I would pull through and grab this way. In which case, it would be appropriate for me to twist the opposite direction. So you've got, um, the kind of shows you different ways in which by freeing your grip and getting hold of the partner's uh, hair, you're in various positions to get into a uh, headlock. And so that's straight, or I may need to turn and catch him, or the other side, I may need to turn and catch him as well. So again, you get this, you know, the cat is it's map mapping out alternatives and possibilities as well. As we mentioned before, there's quite a few uh, throws in this cat. And uh, this movement here, again, we can use that in a, in a throwing way too. Um, Spring and Murray, and we'll just talk about that one. So um, from a clinch, feeling it's appropriate to do so, I'd turn and feed my arm around the back of the opponent's uh, head from here. So this being the application of the first one. What I would then do is just flick my hands, uh, my hips into the way of, uh, of Murray's hips so he can't step round, flick the hip into there, and then from there just turn and twist to roll the opponent uh, over the bat. So a fairly simple throw from there. So you're just turning into here and then using the, the hip motion there, take the opponent uh, over the back from, uh, from that position. So of course, again, you could do it either side. So the cat, you can flip him this way or you can flip him that way. If I do the way on, I would have grabbed the other, uh, the headlock would be the way around. So then the cat gives you the other, old, uh, other alternative from there. I mean, so there are quite a few throws in this kata. From a karate perspective, um, throwing is very much techniques used to kind of augment or back up your striking. So the idea for this would be that I've, I've hit the opponent and I've, I've struck him and he's, he's weakened. So from there, I think, you know, he's, he's, he's nearly almost out on his feet. So I'll step from there and I'll flip him over and take him over for the, uh, for the throw. So um, you wouldn't, wouldn't really use a throw if he was fresh. If he's about, you know, you battered him, he's weakened, that's the time to, uh, to use the throwing techniques. And again, just a simple one there, turn, flip him over the hips, dead easy, dead simple hip throw. Um, so another application for those movements in uh, Chinto. So following on from uh, that sequence, we have this, uh, this turn to here. So again, we'll look at a, a couple of uh, alternative ways of uh, uh, what that cat is representing with that movement. Um, one thing again, if the opponent uh, again is seized from there, what we can be doing is stepping around and hammering into the back of the arm here. Now it's a bit more forceful than the ones we did before. So, for example, you know, if I was trying to flee, opponent seized, cue is I would step him back in and strike into here. Then from there again, uh, hopefully hyperextend the arm, hopefully knock it off, and you can run. Uh, if it doesn't go, what you've got in the cat is the next movement. You've got this the crane stance. So by seizing, grabbing the hair if you had any, or hooking the nose if he hasn't, pulling back, taking a knee into the side of the thigh kind of this movement here. So there's you know, another alternative way of, uh, of using that one. Uh, another nice way is if the opponent double grabs. Now, we'll deal with the single, the single grab applications uh, later on in the form, but you've got this one here. Um, so what I need to do on, on this one is I, I need to make sure I weaken the opponent pretty quickly. I can't move and run. He can't do a great deal to me, man, because he's tied both his arms up. Um, but his friends could, and he can still knee me and he can still headbutt me, so I need to get these this sorted. So the, what the cat stance does is it takes my weight uh, forwards and down. So by using my arms to hit his arms, especially with my weight dropping, this is going to bring the opponent's head forward. It's also going to give him that, that shock, that, that kind of like bang. So if he grabs a bang from here, then will bring both arms straight up. So you're going to strike to, uh, towards his, uh, his face there with your fist. From there again, obviously, you can grab, grab the hair or the ears, just hook your hands here, and then you just unload from there. So opponent grabs from here again, dropping your weight, one, two, and then again, just unload as, uh, as you see fit. So it's another important thing, when you look at kata, always look at what the stance is doing. So the, the weight kind of forwards and down there, or again, aiding with the rotation, the stance is always adding something to the technique. It's always um, getting your body movement into it. So we saw on the, the last technique, I was grabbing the arm, the hair, and putting the knee in. And there's kind of this interesting uh, sequence here. Um, one thing, again, when you're analysing cartilage, you've always got to rule out what it obviously isn't for straight away. Uh, and one thing we've, we've got here is we've got like, a couple of techniques performed while on one leg. So uh, to me, that, I just can't think of an uh, application you do standing on one leg, two techniques in a row. So it, to me, it's obvious what the cat has to be saying is this is an option. This is an option. So it's not saying you do both. It's saying it's doing kind of uh, one or the other and running through. And this whole sequence is kind of like that. They're, they're fairly similar, but we've got uh, one where we step step through and do the, the punch, and one, we've got one where we do um, uh, reverse punches, okay? Uh, different styles do different things, and we'll talk about that as, as we come in. So I'll just borrow Fred first. Uh, and again, it's just a simple countless, a simple handy grab. With this first movement, what we're doing is we're turning. Now, some styles, when they do this, are quite common for the knee to come up. 
There's also quite a lot of styles that don't do that. They just cross the legs from here, just turn the body. So this, this application uh, fits both. So by bringing this arm under here towards the back of the, uh, the opponent's uh, wrist from there, and then I'm turning. So my entire weight is going against the opponent's uh, grip from here. Now what I can do with this free hand is I can, again, by grabbing the hair from there, it pulls back. I can even grab his clothing with it too. Okay, so I just get that leverage. And again, it just prevents him from turning easily into kind of uh, any follow -up punches. Helps keep him off balance. So we're going from there, turning to here. Now what that presents me with, again, is the knee coming in. Now what might happen is, I'm trying to get the arm all the way to here, but his arm might eat up that force. So as I turn from there, um, well, it'll either come loose, completely loose, keep a really tight grip. Again, from there, again, it might not. Um, again, again it, but it doesn't really matter because I've got to where I want it to be. Again, as an alternative, those, the Gidambra, you can also use the hooking uh, uh, actions as well. The arm might come free. Again, if I turn quick enough and fast enough and I go from there, bang, it might come loose. But still the same idea, I just try and re-secure the arm if I can and put the, uh, the knee in, being this. Okay, so you've got the turn, then the knee coming after it. So it's not inconceivable, that's evolved into this. Uh, and another one is, uh, if the opponent grabs, another option is bring these hands to here. So after that sequence, we've got this kind of turn round to there. And again, if it's close enough, you can put the knee in if you like. What we've also got is the arm coming back and the Mayagheri. Now, depending on which leg you kick, depends on the, the re response you'll get from your opponent. Uh, lead legs normally always there. So if I do the Gidambra and the simultaneous kick, the opponent drop. I've got the option of dropping down, pulling his hair there onto his gaku. Some styles do a uh, hook punch from horse stance. Some, some styles punch from horse stance across. Um, some styles don't do a front kick, they do a side kick instead. It doesn't make any difference. Um, if you want to there, if you want to do the, the side kick instead, that's fine, works exactly the same. If you want to drop in and do the hook punch instead, fine. So you see these uh, variations in kata are normally just variations on a, a theme. Now one thing you might get is you, is you turn, if that leg's presented, so as you turn and put that long on, that, that leg might be, be there, the, the back leg. So the knee's no longer really appropriate, right? And I could kick the front leg, but I could also go for the back one. So what I'll do from there is, is I pull the hair back from there and, and kick. But on that one, the opponent's like to fall away slightly. So on that one, stepping through and hitting the opponent is going to be more appropriate. So you've got all these little options that kind of maps out. So I turn, put the lock on from there, put pulling back from here. I go in from there with my Mayagheri on my psychic, but I go along. Right? So again, if the opponent falls away from me from there, it might be more appropriate to step through and then strike. All depends on what the opponent does and what distancing you get. So over, turning, kicking, falls away from me, step through, bang, I'll step through and hit. Gaku's now out of, uh, out of range. So again, we see there the kata maps out in different ways it performs that sequence. And it's, it's mapping alternatives. And because kata's a, a linear method of recording techniques, so one has to follow another, has to follow another, you sometimes get the alternatives put end to end. And it'd be quite easy to think that those movements are supposed to be used together. I use this one and this one. Well, it might be a case of use this one or this one. It's important to understand that when you're, uh, you're looking at your kata. In some styles, this, uh, this, these initial movements here are performed slowly, and then it kind of speeds up. And it's also interesting of the four sequences that are like that, only three of them have this move on the start, which would suggest you know, that there's, uh, we need to explore the possibility that they're used separately. Because um, you've got a slow bit and a fast bit, well, maybe that's there to, to um, emphasize the distinction. You know, this technique is not related to this one. Um, and the fact, again, that, it's, that, that that movement is missing from the end little bit would also kind of support that. So you can use these movements as chokes and strangles as well. There's a lot of uh, close-range stuff in this uh, form. And if we just bring on Mark, and we'll, we'll have a look at, uh, at those. Um, one of the things you, when you're looking at cutter is you've always kind of got follow-through. So um, the arms will kind of, like we saw in the last technique, grab and I pull my arm here. Now I'm trying to get my arm to there, so I need to, re when there's no resistance there, when I'm performing the cutter on my own, I need to pull the arm all the way to here. But in actuality, it might not get that far. The, the opponent will kind of eat that force up. But I'm still trying to do that. And this is what we're going to see on this, this strangle. Uh, we're going to make use of the first part of this. I'm trying to do that with my arms. Um, but again, his gi's going to kind of eat that force up. So if during the course of the fight, I manage to get behind the opponent, Mark's a big guy. Okay? So if I'm going to strangle him, I need to bring him down a bit. So that may be, again, one of the ways of using this. What I'm going to do from there is just drive my knee into the back of his leg, and that will kind of drop him down to my height. This will help get his head against the, uh, the, the back of my, uh, my chest here too. So what we're going to do is this hand from there reaches to this side and pulls down. Now, if you, wish, if you didn't have a, a gi on, it, just imagine the hoop of his sweatshirt. I'd grab that side of his sweatshirt and pull it down, okay? So, or his jacket or whatever, but I'm grabbing that one down. It's to get some tension into it. This hand then grabs as high as I can get that grab, okay? And then shift the arm to there, and I'm going to pull down on this one, and that one goes back. So we're doing this, this arm movement here. So I'm seizing again from there and the season just across and again that'll uh, 
strangle the opponent now. So having, however I've managed to get it during the course of the fight, I've got the back, drive the knee in from there to this side. Pull that arm down from there, get that grip on. Then pull. So we've got this kind of uh, uh, strangling motion uh, there. Um, so that would be option one. Now this could be option two. So what the captain's saying, you know, if you get behind him, you can strangle him out using his, uh, his clothing. We can also do from there, just feed your arm across his neck. Okay, clasp those hands together and just pull in this way. So you can choke him out. So the captain's going, you would knee, and then you can strangle or you can uh, choke. So you've got those, uh, those two options there. And of course, all those techniques, you could use those techniques from the ground. Um, from, you know, if you end up on the back of your opponent, you should explore those, uh, those uh, possibilities too. We'll maybe just look at one of those in a second. So I'll just quickly recap those two. Going behind the opponent, taking the knee in, pull, grab, seize, strangle, or choke off. Um, so if Mark again, just like lie down on the ground for me there. Uh, just head away from me if that's all right. I mean, these are just uh, options you can explore, okay? So one of the things we might have, that strangle, we're using the forearm against the opponent's neck. Well, I, I can do that from the ground. You know, if, if I kind of grab here and put that on from there, I can push down and I can strangle him out. What he might do is put his hand on the underside of my elbow to stop me pushing my arm up. So as I start to go for that strangle, he kind of resists it by pushing that arm here. What I can then do is just grab his clothing and switch to the other one and just start pulling up this way. And I get a different kind of uh, technique on there. So, thanks, Mark. So you've, you've got all these, these possibilities. If the, the cat shows you a strangle, you don't just want to stick to the example the cat gives you. You want to explore, well, how can I use it from this position? How can I use it from that position? How can I vary it? Is there any judo people I know who could show me some variations on this? Um, and, and fully explore the possibility. What the cat is doing is it's showing you a technique that illustrates a principle. It's not, it's not um, something that should imprison you. So you just do the example of the cat and nothing else. What you should do is take what the cat gives you and explore it and explore it and adapt it and vary it. Um, so there's two simple um, a strangle, a choke. Use them and expand your knowledge of uh, those kind of techniques. So using those uh, movements there as chokes and strangles. Then we need to look at um, if this is that separate sequence at the end of it there. Need to look at the uh, applications for those that are separate to those first two. And again, in, in the kata, on that last sequence, the very last sequence of the kata, uh, that's done on its own. This movement doesn't precede it. So we combined it with it when we were looking at the grab escapes, and now we're looking at the choke and strangling options, we're looking at them separately. So we've got the, uh, the, the pulling, the gidambarai, we've got the mayageri, and then we have the gaku in some sequences, we have the step through punch on the, uh, the other sequences. I'm just being on Fred, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about those. So having, um, I've maybe covered up and I've charged in and we've got contact with arms from there. One thing I can do is either grabbing the wrist or grabbing the clothing, but I'll just kind of yank the opponent's arm to one side. Um, having done that, that will turn him slightly and it may expose that, that back leg for me. So what that then is, I'm going to go in with the Mayageri. Now two things can essentially happen there, depending on how I kick him or how his weight's distributed at that time. Um, well, two main things. So if, if I was to kick it from there and the leg f blasts away, okay, so his foot comes up off the floor from there and I just kick it and it drops, he's got, his head's going to be quite close to me. So the, the gaku would be the appropriate option. So the arms have clashed, I pull it out to one side, drive in with the, the, the kick from there, and then I'm going to uh, follow up with my, uh, my punch. And any other number of techniques as well. The, the cat that just shows a uh, punch to start. So we're grabbing, kicking, blasting the leg out, and punching. Now sometimes what can happen is it doesn't move backwards, it gets jammed. So it, it kind of... Rather than doing this, it kind of goes that way. Um, depending on how the opponent's standing or if your kick has a slightly downward force to it. Again, some styles, of course, again, short to can notably do side kicks here, but it's the same, it's the same idea exactly. It's just a kick. Whether you use front kick or side kick, the same principles apply. If that foot jams, having, having done that from there, if you're hitting from there with either the front kick or the side kick and it jams, he's more likely to kind of move away from me as, as he falls. In which case, then, stepping through and hitting is more appropriate. Um, so, so again, again, move from there, again, kick and it jams and he moves away, then I'm going to have to step in and hit. So what the cutter does is on some sequences it does it where it steps and some sequences does it where it drops. And the reason being is it's saying these are the two main scenarios. Now you might get a combination of the two, it might fall somewhere between. So you might shuffle and reverse punch or whatever. Um, but there's, there's options, you can't really determine how he's going to land off that kick. So what the cutter does is it says, well, here's option A, here's option B. And obviously from those you can work out um, all the other variations that might happen in between those two extremes. So the last sequence we'll look at is, uh, is this sequence here. And obviously at the end of that we've got this kick and punch, but we've already explored, uh, explored those ones, okay? So we've got this hooking motion, this elbow, this grab and this spin. The spins again is a pretty unique one, you know, it makes it, well, what possibly could that be, you know? Um, and the way I see that again is follow through. 
Um, so what we've got here, again, we were fighting again at close range, which is the distance you cut the deals with. If I want to get a, a grab on the back of Murray with his arms here, I can't really get the grab in neatly. So what I do is I use this hooking hand there, I bring my arm round and I hook. Now this, again, opens this, this gap up here. So again, we'll be fighting close here. I hook this hand, I grab to the back of the neck. Now you can use that as a strike as well. You can actually slap on the back of the neck. In practice, that's not a good idea. Your partner will quickly get sick of it. But having, having done that, I've then got control of the head. So uh, this elbow movement here as well, if the opponent tries to punch with his hand from here now, again, it's jammed. So it, it, it's, it's a nice little technique. It takes away this side. What I do then from there is I drive in with the elbow. So I pull his head down and drive in towards the elbow with his face. Now, I might, the cat shows it once, but I might do that two or three times, okay? Just to kind of really weaken him up. So we're fighting there, here, going with the elbow. Once I've done that, I, I put my hand on the, the, uh, the back of his head and pull him down to here. So I'm going to, if he's fresh, like, like Murray is now, if I said I'm going to pull you forwards and, you know, Murray's resisted with all his might, you know, he might be able to stay upright from there. So the idea is that I've gone bang. So he's, he's bleeding and distracted, you know, so from there it should be a lot easier to do. What I then do then is I start talking the neck, which again is the, the meaning of this spin. So I'm pushing on the side of the chin and talking his neck through. You see how this turns his body. Now if that leg wasn't already forwards, when you start twisting the neck, it's quite common for the opponent to step forwards with that foot to alleviate the torque on the neck. So this exposes the inside of the thigh here. So I've hooked into here, gone in for the elbow, pulled the head down. Start cranking from there and that exposes that inside. Then I'm driving in here as hard as I can. So in the kata, where there's no leg to eat up that force, that results in this, okay? Um, in actuality, when I do that one, it might not result in that, but I'm bashing that in as hard as I can. Uh, now, what are the effects that will have if I don't have hold of Murray's neck there, but I just bash the leg out uh, from here? Just if you watch what happens with his body, if I do this, you see his head tends to fall in. So you've got that, that you're kind of corkscrewing his body there. So I've elbowed, I'm twisting his neck this way. But when I drive this knee in with force, his body's head naturally wants to fall in. Yeah. So obviously I have to drop that. So you're kind of twisting his entire spine. And so obviously that's a pretty dangerous technique, that. So in practice, you have to kind of break it into two segments. So you can go here, 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 a little bit of a turn and knee. You can do a full turn and take him over with it if you like. Or you can just forget about the turn and put the knee in. Um, what you can't do is what the catheter does, where it grabs, talks him and then drives it in. Because um, there's a possibility you might uh, crank the neck, depending on how the, uh, the opponent moves. And again, you know, you've got a neck cranking option there. Don't just stick with what the cat teaches you. Work on, um, if he grabs me, I could do that. If we're on the ground, we could do that. Work with all those kneeing options as well. Um, if the cat gives you an example, you need to build on the example that the cat gives. That concludes our analysis of, of Chinto, Gang, Kaku, Kata. And obviously, there's more, um, the, the amount of information contained with any technique is completely vast. There's a, there's a lot of stuff in there. So I would encourage you to, to look at the kata as well and to build on the examples we've given here to kind of further your, your, your study of this, uh, this particular form. It's always better to think of kata as a process rather than an actual thing. So what we do is we start le by learning the, the kind of external movements, the solo form. What we should then move on to is to practice those techniques with, uh, with, with, with a partner, learn what the actual technique's for and explore all the possibilities. Um, having done that, then we should look at the variations, um, look at the way different arts maybe make use of the, the same concepts and, and kind of expand our knowledge too. And we also need to make sure we get, gain live experience of doing it so we can set up drills in both in compliant and non-compliant ways um, with, with an opponent. So we gain uh, real experience of actually using the techniques against uh, an opponent who doesn't want them uh, applied upon them. So I hope you've uh, enjoyed uh, watching this DV. I hope it's ex expanded your understanding of, of Chinto and Gankaku. And I hope you've you found it uh, useful and beneficial.